Uh, last evening, I was searching on YouTube for certain things, and this title popped up, and it was a debate uh, between Christopher Hitchens and someone. It ended up being actually mostly Christopher Hitchens talking and the, his opponent, like, saying something. But during the closing remarks of Christopher Hitchens' uh, comments, I captured this, these words, and I want to play them for you, and then I want to respond to them. It was not read. I'll close the tape because I've got only a minute. Why wouldn't I believe in this? Uh, why, 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 why might one not want to believe in it, even if it could be true? Because my view is that it's not only not true, but it's probably a good thing it isn't. Why is it not a good thing? Because I don't think it's healthy for people to want there to be a permanent, unalterable, irremovable authority over them. I don't like the idea of a father who never goes away. And nor do you, if you think about it, when you get closer to parenthood, you won't say to your children, don't worry, I'll never die. You won't be at my funeral, I'll be at yours. I'll be at your grandchildren's funeral. You'll never hear the end of me. So that's just a portion of what he had to say. And the reason that I played this is because these are words from his own mouth. <clears throat> he never says God. He does talk about the Father, obviously implying the Father that we read about in Scripture. And basically, he says, I don't want some authority like this over me. I wonder if that's not really the bottom line issue with atheism. They talk about the scientific evidence, supposed scientific evidence for this or that, and <clears throat> all the other nuances of atheism. And... <clears throat> In Christopher Hitchens' own words from his own mouth, I don't want God over me. And that's probably the root of the problem with most, most atheists. You know, in Job's day, Job was talking about the wicked in Job chapter 21. And in verse 14, he says, They say to God, Depart from us. We don't e do not even desire the knowledge of your ways. And in verse 15 of Job 21, Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what would we gain if we entreat him? And what Mr. Hitchens fails to understand is God the Father that we read about in Scripture is not a bad being to be around forever. He's one that has always wanted to bless those who serve him. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Hitchens passed away, I think December 16th of 2011. And I know that he's changed his mind about this now. And that's really sad. You know, when the Apostle Paul was was early in his life he was he was a pharisee of pharisees i mean he was a jew to the core but once he became a christian he became one of if not the most powerful advocate for god and christ in all the new testament in the first century and we read in 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 uh, romans chapter 1 where Paul is addressing the Christians, the church at Rome, and he's very straightforward when he says in Romans 1, beginning with verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident in them, verse 19, for God has made it evident to them. And in Romans 1 verse 20, Paul says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature, or Godhead, 
have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. You couldn't make a more plain statement about a reason for believing in God if you tried. The evidence of a greater power, even if we did not know what that was or who it is, um, the evidence for a greater power, even without the Bible, shows that it's just, it's everywhere. And then, of course, the Bible brings us into focus on who that great power is. And, and, it's, and it's God, it's Christ, it's the Holy Spirit. And when Paul was converted, <clears throat> you know, he went preaching everywhere. And he was primarily a preacher to Gentile peoples. And we find him in the 17th chapter of Acts on a place called Mars Hill or the Areopagus. And he was, he was waiting for uh, Timothy and Silas. And we see in verse 16 that while Paul was waiting for them, in Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles <clears throat> and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And some, also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him and some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? In other words, he doesn't really have anything to offer. What is he trying to tell us? He seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And he, they took him and they brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. So we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. And in verse 22 of Acts 17, Luke's record says, So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all aspects or all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. And, and Paul goes on to proclaim to these confused people who really didn't know who God was, so they had a God for everything. And then in case they missed one, they had an altar for the one they may have missed, an unknown God. Paul says, let me tell you about the true God. The God, verse 24, Acts 17, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their habitation. Why, Paul? So that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being or exist, even as some of your own people or poets have said, for we are also his offspring. And when Paul speaks of children of God here, he's not talking about Christians or believers, but God's creation, all people. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think of the divine nature. that is like gold or silver or stone or an image formed by the art and thought of man. Therefore, overlooking the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to all men that all people everywhere should repent. So Paul begins with telling them about the God that made the world and all things in it. And he lets these people know that 
he's the creator and he's not served by uh, making idols. And he has put people where they are for the very purpose of groping for and finding God. I say this to the atheists. You can find God if you want to. Now, you can be like Christopher Hitchens and people like him and just find everything that you want to to try to disprove the existence of God, but you're fighting against some powerful evidence that shows there is a God. And, and Paul is declaring that. And he says even some of your own poets have, have said we are his children. Even the poets of these philosophers knew that some God made us. It just depends on what a person's looking for. But here's the thing. Mr. Hitchens is now, he's dead, he's answering for his decision. We will all answer for our decisions. And it's more than just believing in God, because in verse 30 of Acts 17, Paul says that God has declared to all men that they should all everywhere repent, change our minds. What did he preach? Jesus and the resurrection. He preached the gospel pointing people to Christ, to believe in him, to repent of their sins, confess the name of Jesus. And just like Peter and Paul and all the New Testament preachers in the, our New Testament's taught to be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. And But some of these people struggled with this resurrection. But listen, verse 31 says, because God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through the man whom he has appointed or ordained, having furnished proof to all men, but raising him from the dead. Paul moves from creation to the fact that idols are fruitless and that's not how you serve God, to even some of your own people know that some God made us, and then he proclaims the true God and Jesus. And one of these days, that Jesus who many people refuse to listen to, will judge us. In John 12, 48, he's going to, says he's going to use the words that he has spoken to judge on the last day. I encourage people not to listen to foolish people like Christopher Hitchens. Our young people are listening to these atheists all the time, and some of our Christian young people are turning away from their Christian upbringing, their biblical foundation, the understanding of truth, and they started listening to people like that. I want to say this, and then I'll wrap this up. If you listen closely to people like Christopher Hitchens, he made a lot of uh, comments about some of the conflict with so-called Christians and churches. And he brings up people that did things in the name of God they shouldn't have. Listen, people have done that since the dawn of time. Just because somebody abuses Christianity or abuses the Bible or says they're doing something in the name of God, although they don't have authority of God to say that, doesn't mean there's no God. It doesn't mean there's not a valid word from God called the Bible. It doesn't mean that Christianity does not exist in a valid form in Scripture. People mispractice God's commands all the time, but that does not invalidate God. It does not invalidate His Word. It does not invalidate Christianity, and it will not remove the Day of Judgment. There is a God we sing in one of our hymns, He is alive, in Him we move and we survive. And one day we'll answer to Him. I speak to many people who may watch me on Facebook, and I appreciate that. It's not about me. Never has been, never will be. It's about God, His Word, and His will. If you're listening and you're not a Christian, you need to become one. Hear, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized and become a member of the church that Jesus died for. If you're listening and you're not a faithful Christian, it's time to repent. And don't wait till the day of judgment because it'll be too late. But God is waiting. 
Jesus would say, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, because you will find rest for your souls. That's what Jesus promises. I want a father like God who's promised wonderful, indescribable blessings in eternity. I don't want to be like the people Job wrote about. Says God just, and I'm going to paraphrase, we don't want anything to do with you. Well, unfortunately, for the people that say that now, they will have something to do with him one day. Let's have something to do with God today. While it is today, while it is today, while we have time, and don't wait until it's too late. God loves us. Let's love him in return.